You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and this is a conversation between myself and a fella from the UK called Stephen Wilson. Stephen has a Australian tour on the horizon. I'll read out some dates. They're all in November. Thursday the 8th, he's playing Brisbane. Friday the 9th, he's playing Sydney. And finally, Saturday the 10th, he's playing Melbourne. Heads up, the audio quality of the conversation isn't great, but the content, as per usual, is. So here we go. Let's have a listen to what the outstanding UK-based artist Stephen Wilson has to say. Hi, Andrew. Hi there. Hi, Stephen's on the line, Maya. Thanks very much. Hello, Hello, mate. How's things? Very good. How are you, sir? Yeah, not too bad, mate. I, I asked this question in good humour and good faith, mate. How's the Aussie phone grind been treating you? Because I imagine you're fairly used to it, but are we, uh, are we keeping uh, you entertained? Everyone has been very courteous. And everyone's kept to their time slot so far, so it's, it's all going very smoothly. Thank you for asking. Wonderful. No problem, mate. Well, look, I'll kick things off. So you must be aware that you have quite a fan base down here. So there are a lot of people that are anticipating your shows with vigour. What sort of show are you bringing down, and is it going to be? Is there going to be some surprises in the show for Australian audiences? Well, I hope so. I mean, first to, to answer the first part of your question, the show, every time I go out and tour, I try and, and raise the bar a little bit in terms of what I do uh, with the visuals. And certainly, this this show has taken a big step up um, in terms of the you know the kind of visual content of the show, the immersive quality. There's a lot of new films. There are multiple screens. So it's very much, uh, you know, still an audio-visual experience, uh, a much bigger and better one than I've ever uh, presented before. Um, and um, what was the second part of your question again, sorry? The... Oh, is there anything special for us down here, just being Australian? Right, 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 yes. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. In terms of, uh, in terms of the, the songs I'm playing now, obviously people w- will be expecting a lot of music from t- the To The Bone record. But let's just say I've also gone a, a little bit deeper into my uh, into my back catalogue of songs than perhaps I have ever done before. Certainly as a solo artist, yeah. um, I've, I've tended to avoid my my back catalogue, and this time around I've embraced it a little bit more. Cool. So I think maybe if there's some fans that, that thought you know they were never going to get to hear songs from the Blackfield catalogue or the Porcupine Tree catalogue played by me and my band, they might be pleasantly surprised this time and, and I'll, I'll say no more about it for now there you go the only other question i've got about that is do you think anything from altamont will get a bit of a go on this uh live circuit this time <laughs> <around>? <laughs> wow uh god i i can't even I, you know i probably haven't heard that music for 30 years or so yeah uh yeah i wouldn't hold your breath for that no <laughs> So have we been a strong territory for you or are we one of those territories that's embraced you before other parts of the world um, you know what? I, I I think it's fair to say that my my kind of following has grown in a very organic way, mm. almost from the beginning on a worldwide basis. Now I say that because I never really had a lot of um, what you would call you know mainstream coverage. You know, you'd never, very rarely, well, a little yeah. bit more so these days, but certainly for many years, very rarely would hear me on the radio. Very, you wouldn't see me on TV. So I think also allied to the fact that my, you know, my, my first sort of musical offerings were about the same time the internet was beginning to mm-hmm. feature quite heavily in everyone's life. So I think what happened is the following began to grow in a very organic word of mouth way, almost from the beginning. And it meant that even as early as, you know, my second or third album, I had some fans in Australia. I had some fans yeah. in India. I had some fans in Mexico. Not not enough maybe to go and play a show at that time. But it was kind of symptomatic of the fact that the, the following was growing almost internationally from the beginning in this very organic way. Now, I remember there being a lot of interest from Australia very early on, but of course being such a, a you know, in terms of where I'm from, a remote country, yeah. It was one of the last places I actually ever managed to get out to play live. But by the time I did that with Porcupine Tree, I think there was quite a substantial audience that had built up that was very, very excited and, and, and anticipating uh, us playing there. Um, so, I, does that answer your question? I, I think I was, I think I was aware. Yeah. 
I think, yeah, I was definitely aware of, of a, fo- a strong following building up in Australia right from the very early days, which was very gratifying. I think one of the, the great strengths of your material is this, so I'm going to quote one of your lyrics for a moment. I've only done this, you know, over 300 interviews, I've only done this once before. So the lyric is, I'm tired of Facebook, tired of my failing health, I'm tired of everyone, and that includes myself. So certainly as far as I'm concerned, in the grand tradition of great English songwriters and lyricists such as Mark Burgess from the excellent novel Look Chameleons, you articulate and you manage to articulate the deepest aspects of humanity's psyche. You've got some notable contributions, such as that lyric from Pariah that I just narrated or recited, but... Mate, where do you draw your lyrical inspiration from? Because it is profound, if you don't mind me saying. Well, that's really flattering if you say so. I mean, it, it, it's obviously something I'm very proud of, is, is my lyrics. And it's something that people don't often talk about. Hmm. I think one of the things about being um, someone who listens to music is very often people consider the lyrics to be, not always, but a lot of people consider them to be almost incidental, you know, just part of the fabric of the music and of course i think in 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 the best you know music pop music the lyrics are kind of a part of the fabric of it they sh- at least they should feel a part of the overall musical experience but i do think it's possible to to write music and to also write lyrics which are uh, which kind of encapsulate some quite deep and meaningful ideas and i've always thought the pop song the rock song was able to embody quite serious subject matter and make people think about the world they live in, in the best tradition um, that art should, whether it's cinema, you know, literature, whatever it is, poetry, whatever it is, I think great art can make people reflect on the world they live in. It's almost like holding up a mirror and saying to that person, do you recognize yourself in the mirror? Do you, is this something that you, you, you can mm. you know, relate to and respond to? And it's always gratifying to me when people like yourself pick up on and I'm, by the way, that lyric you you read out, I'm very proud of that. You know? Great, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, sometimes I wonder where it comes from myself. You know, sometimes it's very easy to write something and sit back and read what you've written on the page and say to yourself, that's actually really good. How the hell did I write that? <laughs> um, where did it come from? Yeah. And I, and I suppose the answer to your question is I can't really articulate to you exactly where these things come from, except to say, of course, they come from my own observations about the world I live in and, and my place in that world. And, you know, and I am tired of Facebook and I am tired of the influence it seems to have um, on, on my, my species. Um, mm. And I'm very worried about how the internet has, in an incredibly short period of time, 20, 25 years, almost changed this species beyond recognition. Um, that is a very worrying thing, and you will see that paranoia, of course, reflected in a lot of my lyrics, as you would expect. Yeah, great response. Yeah, great response. And the other point that I'd make too, and I know you're a humble bloke, mate, so take this with a grain of salt, but you have been compared quite rightly to two of the, the biggest and greatest British rock bands of all time, that being Radiohead and Pink Floyd. And I appreciate that it's a heavy cross to bear, particularly when critics and indie journalists such as myself start seeing a lot of parallels between their music and your music, but what kind of a legacy would you like to leave after it's all said and done, and dare I use the word retire? I know it's many tens of maybe you know decades away yet, but what sort of a le- legacy would you like to leave? I think it's quite, it's quite simple, really. I mean, most pop music is by definition, or rock music, but it's by definition kind of like fairly ephemeral, so it, it, it's kind of made for the current age, and usually within 10 to 20 years, it's, it's kind of forgotten. Mm. Now, that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with making music just for the now, without any thought about the future. But the, the artists you mentioned, Pink Floyd, Radiohead, the, the Zeppelins, the Beatles, mm. the, 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 you know, there are certain, Michael Jackson's, the Princes, the Bowies, the Elton Johns, there are certain artists that you just know instinctively people will still be discovering and will still be connecting to in 100 years, 200 years, in the same way that people still still connect with Beethoven and Mozart. Um, I would love to believe, I would love to believe somehow I will be in, in that group um, of artists that are still listened to and still appreciate. And I suppose in a way, you know, to use a rather pretentious word, have 
you know, the kind of artists that have a legacy mm. which lives on after the age that they have made it in. And that really is, you know, that, that, that kind of, you know, wanting some degree of immortality with what you create. I think that's, that's the most you can ever expect from what you do. And, and I hope, you know, my, my own little pretentious ambition is that that music <laughs> will still prevail. Yeah. Well, you've got a good chance of doing it, such as the quality of your output, mate. And, oh, look, I'll make it, this my final question. Your career, unbelievably, mate, you're approaching your fourth decade. So, look, I'm in my fourth decade, so it makes me feel old too. Don't worry about that. But did you think you'd be doing it all these years later after you started Altamont when you were 15? Wow. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double-edged thing, really, because I think probably when I was 15, I couldn't think about anything else except spending my life making music. But at the same time, if you told the 15-year-old kid what an incredible struggle it would have been over 35 years of making music, mm. I think I would have been disappointed. Um, now, I find myself, knowing everything that I do about the world that we live in, being actually not particularly disappointed because I, I, you know, I understand the world has changed. But I think I would have been disappointed if you told that 15-year-old kid that it's simply going to be impossible to make the kind of music you want to make but be as big as these artists that you love have been. Because it's simply not possible, it would, it would simply not be possible for a band like Pink Floyd to reach the kind of level of, of awareness that they, aware, that they achieved in the 21st century. And that that's something I've had to come to terms with and acknowledge to myself that I live in a very different world to the world that the music that inspired me existed in. And while it was possible for bands like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd to become stadium-filling global rock stars without even releasing a single, yeah. it's simply not possible to do that in, in the 21st century. So I think I, if you'd said that to that 15-year-old kid, listen, I don't think it would have changed that 15-year-old kid's uh, ambitions. I think I still would have wanted to do what I've done. Mm -hmm. But I would have probably been disappointed and shocked to find that the world I was going to make music in was not going to be the same world that the music that I had grown up listening to was made in, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes complete sense, mate. And i better leave it there so you can get to the next one, but your final point will be congratulations on an extraordinary career and long may, may you continue to make music because you are one of those artists that has endeared yourself to other musicians, which I'm one of them, and also to real aficionados, real aficionados of music, you know, the people that get into funk and jazz, deep and uh, deep house electronic music, that sort of thing. You, you cover so much genre splicing, if you like, within your own music and within your audience too, and I hope you understand that and see that reflected in your audience too and the impact that you make as an artist. I do, and that's actually the aspect that I appreciate most about my, my career, and it's very nice of you to say so. And it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Andrew, anyway. No worries, mate. All the very best, eh? <laughs> Cheers, mate. Have a great time. Catch you. Bye. You have been listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and that was a conversation that featured the UK-based artist Stephen Wilson. Thank you so much for listening.